Chapter 13 of 2,000 Miles Below by Charles Willard Diffin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. N73 Clear. You fly, of course, demanded Governor Drake. Smitty nodded. Unlimited license, all levels. They had spent the night in the executive mansion, and now the governor had burst precipitately into the room where Smitty and his father had just finished dressing. The two had been deep in an earnest conversation which the governor's entrance had interrupted. "'I am drafting you for service,' said the governor. "'I want you to go out to field number three, a fast scout plane. National Guard equipment will be ready for you.' He broke off and stared doubtfully at a paper in his hand, a radiophone message, Smitty judged. "'I'm in a devil of a fix,' the governor exclaimed after a pause. Then... I don't doubt your sincerity, he told Smitty. Never saw you until yesterday. But your father's okay goes a hundred percent with me. Old J.G. and I have been through a lot of scrapes together. His frowning eyes relaxed for a moment to exchange twinkling glances with the older man. No, it isn't that, he added, but... Again he stared at the flimsy piece of paper. What's on your mind, Bill? asked Smith, Sr. The stuff the boy told us was pretty wild. He laid one hand affectionately upon Smitty's shoulder. But he's a poor liar, Gordon is, and knowing his weakness, he usually sticks to the truth. And there's no record of insanity in the family, you know. If there's something sticking in your crop, Bill, cough it up. And the Honorable William B. Drake obeyed. Listen to this, he commanded, and read from the paper in his hand. Replying to your inquiry about the doings at Seven Palms, some Indians did that job. No help needed. I can handle this. Posse organized, and we are leaving right now. Signed, Jack Dower, Sheriff, Cocos County. That sounds authentic, said Smitty dryly. I've met the sheriff. Now, if it was Indians that got tanked up and came down off the reservation, burned seven palms, and cleaned up your camp, began Governor Drake. It wasn't, Smitty interrupted hotly. I told you. He felt his father's hand gripping firmly at his shoulder. Steady, said Smith, Sr. Let him talk, son. There's an election three months from now, J.G., said the governor, and you know they're riding me hard. Let me make one false move, just one, anything that the opposition can use for a campaign of ridicule, and my goose is cooked to a turn. Gordon Smith shook off his father's restraining hand and took one quick forward step. His face, even through the tan of the desert sun, was unnaturally pale. "'Election be damned!' he exploded. "'Dean Rawson has been captured by those red devils. "'He's down there, the whitest white man I ever met. "'I've been to the sheriff. Now I've come to you. "'Do you mean to tell me there isn't any power in this state to back me up when—' "'He stopped. There was a tremble in his voice he could not control. "'Good boy,' said Governor Drake, softly. "'Now I know it's the truth.' Yes, you'll be backed up, plenty, but for the present it will be strictly unofficial. Now pull in your horns and listen. You know the lay of the land. I want your help. Go out to field three. There'll be a man there waiting for you. Don't call him Colonel. He's also strictly unofficial today. The sheriff and his posse will be there at Seven Palms inside an hour. I want you to be there, too, about 5,000 feet up. Tell Colonel Culver, I mean Mr. Culver, your story. Tell him everything you know. He'll be in charge of operations if we have to send in troops. He'll give you that private and unofficial backing I spoke of if we don't. Now get down there. Keep your eye on the sheriff's crowd and see everything that happens. But Smitty's parting remark was to his father. It was a continuation of the subject they had been discussing before. You can buy it at your own price, he said. They've got rights to the whole basin, but they've quit. I'm not treating them to a double cross. And he added as he went out of the room, Buy it for me, if you don't want it yourself. It was a two-place open cockpit plane that Smitty found had been set aside for him. Dual control. The stick in the forward cockpit carried the firing grip that controlled the slim blue machine guns firing through the propeller. Behind the rear cockpit, a strange, unwieldy, double-ended weapon was recessed and streamlined into the fuselage. 
the scout seemed quite able to protect itself in an emergency. Beside the plane, a tall, slender man in civilian attire was waiting. He stuck out his hand while the gray eyes in his lean, tan face scanned Smitty swiftly. I'm Culver. Understand I'm to be your passenger today. How about it? Can you fly this ship? 750 de Gross motor. Retractable landing gear, of course. She hits 450 at top speed. Snappy. Quick on the trigger. Smitty shook his head dubiously. 450? I'm not accustomed to that. But you can take the stick, Mr. Culver, if I get in a hurry and jump out and run on ahead. You see, I'm used to my own ship. An Asigi special job does 500 when I'm pressed for time. The lean face of Mr. Culver creased into a smile. You qualify, he said, but keep your hands off the dead mule. At an inquiring glance, he pointed to the heavy, half-hidden weapon that Smitty had noticed. Can't kick, he explained, hence dead mule. It's the new Rickert Recoilless. Throws little shells the size of your thumb, but they raise hell when they hit. Sounds interesting. Smitty climbed into the rear cockpit and strapped himself in. Show me how it works. Then I won't do it. A pistol grip moved under Culvert's reaching hand, and the strange weapon sprang from concealment like something alive. The pistol grip moved sideways, and the gun swung out and down, its muzzle almost touching the ground. Smitty was suddenly aware that a crystal above his instrument board was reflecting that same bit of sun-baked earth. A dot of black hung stationary at the crystal's center. "'That's your target,' Colbert's voice held all the pride of a child with a new toy. But he released the grip, and the ungainly gun swung smoothly back to its hiding place. He settled himself in the forward cockpit. "'You will find a helmet there,' he said. "'It's phone-equipped. You can tell me all about that wild nightmare of yours while we jog along.' The white beam from the dispatcher's tower had been on them while they talked. Other planes were waiting on the field. Smitty smiled as he settled the helmet over his head. For a strictly unofficial flight, he thought, we're getting darned good service. He taxied past a hangar, where uniformed men pointedly paid them no attention. He swung the ship to the line as airboard regulations required. N-73 was painted on the monoplane's low wings that seemed scraping the ground. N-73 clear, the dispatcher's voice radioed into Smitty's ears. Then the 750-horsepower de Gross let loose its voice as Smitty gunned her down the field. Whatever doubts Colonel Culver may have had of Smitty's ability were dissipated as they made their way cautiously through the free-flying area under 5,000. Everywhere were mail planes, express and passenger ships, taking off for the transcontinental day run, and private planes scattering to the smaller landing areas among the flashing lights of the flat-topped business blocks. Among them, Smitty threaded his way toward the green-lighted transfer zone, where he spiraled upward. At 10,000, he was on his course. He set the gyro control, which would fly the ship more surely than any human hands, and the airspeed indicator crept up to 450 miles an hour that Culver had promised. Not till then did he give the man in the forward cockpit the details of his nightmare. He had not finished answering the other's incredulous questions when he throttled down to slow cruising speed and nosed the ship toward a distant expanse of sage-blurred sand. Outside the restricted metropolitan area, he had already dropped out of the chill wind that struck them at 10,000. Behind them and off to the right was the gray rampart of the Sierra. Ahead, a rough circle of darker hills enclosed the great bowl that he had learned to know as Tana Basin. Some feeling of unreality in his own experiences must have crept into his mind. Unconsciously, he had been questioning his own sanity. Now, at sight of the sandy waste where he and Rawson had labored, with the dark slopes of desolate craters looming ahead and a blot of blurred wreckage directly below to mark the site of their camp, the horrible reality of it gripped him again. He could not speak at first. The air of the 5,000 level was not uncomfortably warm, but Smitty was feeling again the baking heat of the desert land. Again he was with Rawson in the volcanic crater. 
Dean was calling to him, warning him. A sharp question from Culver was repeated twice before Smitty could reply. He side-slipped in above the crater's ragged rim, heedless of downdrafts. The power of the DeGrosse motor would pull them out of anything in a 10,000-foot vertical climb if need arose. Smitty was pointing toward a confusion of shining black rock. Over there, he told Culver. Then he was shouting into the telephone transmitter. It's open, he said. That's where Dean went down. And there they are. Look, man. There. There. End of chapter 13